You know, um, I, I don't. I, I think I gave you. Um, did I give you Luke thirteen? I'll look it up in my Bible. I got so many verses that um, I didn't. Uh, I wasn't sure where to go. I wasn't sure how this would go today, um, and which is a good thing, I think, you know. But Luke um, 13, or excuse me, Luke 12, 54. Do we have that one? I think I gave you 54 and 55. Um, I want, about, I don't know, two, three years ago, two years ago, I don't remember. I taught on God is texting from heaven. Do anybody remember that? Oh, yeah, thank you. And um, uh, God is texting from heaven. Well, why, why would I say that? Because one of my... DNA versus, I use that term DNA, when I was called, uh, when we got, uh, came to start really coming to the Lord in 1976, Pam and I, went to, at that time, the only vineyard, which was under King Gullickson, who we love him, and um, God began to move in our life, but then shortly thereafter, he began to call, called me, you know, he said he's going to call me to be a pastor. I had never had the word pastor enter, go out of my mouth my whole life, and uh, Never heard anyone ever mention the word. I mean, I'm sure they did, but I never did. I never mentioned the word. But he said, anyway, he said, I, I called you that. And then in no, October of 78, he said he called me into a, uh, something else as well. But anyway, um, he began to show me things uh, about the days ahead. And is, I was a relatively young believer. And uh, uh, part of it was to be able to understand, which is where I'm really going today, the title of this teaching will be, uh, are, are we hearing him who is speaking from heaven? If God is speaking from heaven, which I use the term, one of my DNA verses, even when I was a, a little baby pastor, really, only about three years old and the Lord started preaching, I started preaching about he's going to shake everything that can be shaken, which is Hebrews 12, right? And which we'll go to next. But one of the things is if God's shaking things, you know, if he's doing something and he's not here on the earth, the Holy Spirit's here on the earth, we know Jesus lives in our heart, but he's at the right hand of God. It's a mystery. He's everywhere at once, but he's seated at the right hand of God. And so he's talking to them when he's on the earth and he's saying to them, he's correcting them, telling them that they do not know what time it is and they don't know what's going on. And then, unfortunately, in uh, Luke 19, starting around verse 41, he is heaving. The word says Jesus wept. It's way, way beyond weeping. He's heaving uncontrollably, saying, you didn't know the time of your visitation. And he said, they'll take your children and smash them to the ground. That's what he told them. You read it, Luke 19. He says to this crowd, when you see a cloud rising in the west, immediately you say it's going to rain. And it does. And when the south, winds blow, south wind blows, you say, it's going to be hot, and it is. Hypocrites. You know how to interpret the appearance of the earth and the sky. How is it that you don't know how to interpret this present time? He basically said the same thing in uh, Luke 19. So I want to now put up uh, uh, um, Hebrews 12.25. And I'm going to tell you a little story that will be Alive, And I think you should look it up. I think it's really quite interesting. We get Hebrews um, 12.25 up there. It says, basically, and this is where I'm really going, that if they couldn't hear him, watch this, see to it that you do not what? Him who what? Speaks. Now, in the context of this, he's going to talk about what it was like when the Lord was speaking from heaven uh, to, excuse me, on the earth at Mount Sinai, to the Jewish people, to the Israeli people. And he was giving them the Ten Commandments. Moses goes up to the mountain and all that. And the whole mountain shook and they were all freaked out. Okay? That's what he's talking about here. See to it that you do not refuse him who speaks. If they, that is in Exodus, where they did not escape when they refused him, who warned them on what? Who warned them on earth, right? How much more or less will we, if we turn away from him, who what? warns us or speaks to us warnings from where? Well, okay, so you say, well, you know, Jesus is coming again. Yes, he is. Praise the Lord. You know, the Holy Spirit's moving. Yes, he is. Praise the Lord. But nothing compared to what's going to be happening very soon as the kingdom begins to start coming in a visible manner to the earth, more so than we've ever known, because it'll come uh, to prepare the way for the king himself. And, uh, but here it says that he's speaking from heaven. Now, let me just give you a few little things here that may, you may find of interest. And um, last night, I had a real mini dream, but it was very interesting. 
um, knowing my little history, when my kids were young, especially our son Joseph and, and Laura, he's 31, she's 26, and Mary, um, who's 36. But anyway, usually around that time, uh, I started taking Joseph. He, he liked, he had never really been. So I got him a boogie board and stuff, and we head down to Santa Monica Beach. And we would just go in there. I'd body surf, he'd have his thing, and we'd take his friends, three or four guys, you know. Uh, I think maybe a girl or Laura at times would all go with us. And we would go there, and I'd always be prepared. I know what exactly was going to happen. So in this dream, I'm going to the beach again, but I look down, and I'm thinking, dang, those waves are big, and they're coming up, and it's, we're not going to get into it. It's too radical. It's too wild. And then I realized, what the heck? We're on a cliff. How am I going to get down anyway if I was going to go? And the meaning of the dream was, what you were so familiar with before, it's going to shake you up. Now, and the thing was, is in the dream, I knew, I thought, why didn't I check the weather? Why didn't I, you know, Google it and see what's going on at the beach or something, you know what I mean? What's the weather going down there? You know, how are the waves or whatever? Or, you know, and I ended up, you know, it I thought was going to be an easy thing. And it was just like, wow, what the heck? This is crazy. And so what I'm going to show you is how that applies today. That it wasn't so much he was just saying to me, he was saying, look, Rick, the church, much of the church, doesn't realize the intensity of the day that we're moving in. Yeah, I hope, I hope you are all like that. I mean, those of us that, uh, you know, seek Jesus, we, we know uh, what he's saying, what he's been doing, and so forth. But it says, uh, if we turn away from him who warns us from heaven. Now, there's, I don't want to sound too critical here, but there's prophets, you know, on the internet and so forth. And, uh, but the, the prophets of doom, supposedly, whoever they are, which in the 70s would have been David Wilkerson. Anybody ever heard of him? Yes. Well, um, all of the, most of what he prophesied was front page news uh, way before he died and continues to be. But he was uh, ostracized from even the prophetic movement that I was in the, we were involved in it for sure. We were there when it was birthed. Uh, Dr. Hammond, Bill Hammond, Christian International, we were actually on the stage with him at that time when it was birthed in 1988 the prophetic movement it was also birthed through Rick Joyner and Mike Bickle those were the three main ones in the quote charismatic world in America so we were very much involved and loved those people but there has been a thing about negativity don't prophesy anything it's negative and it's like you know I think uh, uh, one of my chapters in my book is going to be Jesus the weeping judge and his prophets of doom which was every prophet in the Bible including himself. And by the way, they never said, thus saith Isaiah. If you know your Bible, they said, thus saith the Lord. So what I'm saying is, is that he warns us. People don't like warnings. You know, when I was a little kid, I'll tell you where my mother warned me, but it was like very serious. Rick, Ricky, do not run out in the street. My sweet mother would talk like that. I'm glad she did. Aren't you? That your mom said that? whatever she said. Oh, I'll tell you another one. Don't touch the oven. Oh, I did. <laughs> Once. You understand? So warnings are very important, but they're not acceptable even in the prophetic movement in the charismatic Church of America. I've said it before. I'll say it one more time again because people are telling me to say it. No. Elijah could not get on the Elijah list. I've told you that before. He could not. He could not. He, pro he was a prophet of doom. He's a prophet of doom. He can't do that. Can't say it's not going to rain. That's, we want something edifying. Well, tough baloney is what I say to him. Because it's the spirit and power of Elijah who will prepare you to be a people prepared for the Lord. So, uh, I am nice, but those things... Who said what? Who said what? Oh, who said? I don't know. I, no, I, Sandy. I'm very correctable, Sandy. Thank you. I'm not nice, but I, I don't want people who have been here the first time to think that, you know, I have a chip on my shoulder. But I want to defend the Word of God Amen. and the prophets of the Lord. Amen. So anyway, um, uh, there, there, there you have it. So what happened was, is if you remember October, excuse me, August 21st, anybody remember? What happened August 21st in America? Oh! The eclipse. Do you remember that eclipse? What did they call it? The American eclipse. Anybody remember? How many? 
two or three of you. Okay, anyway, it was the American eclipse. What seven cities did it go over in America from the, e- from the West Coast all the way to the East Coast? It hit what it went. Go online and ask about what happened when that eclipse came. It went over seven cities. You can draw a line to show the line of the eclipse. It goes over seven cities. They all had the same name. What was the name of it? Salem. Salem, which is the last part of the, of the name for Jerusalem. Okay? It means peace and security. Really? It seems like, you know, like, what? Because after that, I'll explain why. Because God was, and it, and it went over, how many of them? Seven. What's the number seven in Gematria? What's it mean? Completeness or perfection. Okay? Or God. It's a, it's a thing of maturity. So it was a sign of peace and security for the mature. Who are hearing what the Spirit's saying who are hearing what God is saying from heaven. Are you okay with that? Okay, well, that's the interpretation I got. Anyway, so here's the deal. If you go online and you ask, what seven cities? You'll watch it goes right across those, those. Now, that's where, who came out of Salem in the very beginning of the Bible? It was Melchizedek. He was king of Salem, right? So Jesus, Melchizedek, as David was, was a type of Jesus, who was a priest, So Jesus is saying, I'm praying for my mature church, my remnant church, or however many it is, I'm praying for you to realize I'm moving in your nation, but I'm going to make a difference between my children in, quote, Goshen and those in Egypt. Are you with me? If you remember in the church and in the Old Testament, had to go through the first three or four plagues, four plagues. But in Exodus 8.22, it says, And God made a difference between his people in Goshen and those not. Now, it doesn't mean that Christians aren't involved in some of these judgments. But I just want to say this. I believe that if you're going to be around an area where something dramatic is going to happen, I believe he, his sheep will hear his voice. That's what I believe. But you know, a lot of people are preaching. I mean, there's huge churches around here, one in particular over in this area, over here, that they don't believe God speaks except through his written word. As if God is mute. Poor Jesus. You know, he can write, but he can't speak. You know. But the the Bible, the last book in the Bible says seven times to each of the churches, he that hath an ear, let him hear. So, there you go. And I know you're excited. Now, okay, so, in August 21st, get it now? August 21st, that's when this came through. You got it? And it was called the American Eclipse. And it went across uh, our nation. Okay, then uh, what happened was, is um, uh, August 25th, um, Houston, Houston, Hurricane what? Harvey was prophetic for something to come, which we'll go to next. He that hath an ear, let him hear, you know, what's God saying from heaven? That's That's where I'm going with this. I want you to hear God speaking from heaven. What do you mean, Pastor? It's the days of Noah. It's the days of Noah. He's speaking from heaven. He's still at the right hand of God, but he's speaking from heaven. So on the 25th of August, just four days later, um, kaboom, okay? Now, the brother who prophesied it a year before is someone who we know personally. I've had lunch with him and talked with him a few times. Not well, but I know him. Is a brother named Sadu. Anybody know who Sadu is? A few of you do, okay. Well, anyway, um, he's a man of God. And he prophesied that there would be a major flood in Houston, okay? And um, so about a month ago or three weeks ago, my wife and I are watching him, that is Sadu, being interviewed on the Jim Baker show. And um, anyway, so they're talking and so forth. And he said, you know, you, is it true that you prophesied about this? He says, yes, sir, I did. And... Um, uh, is anything going to happen again? He goes, yes, sir, it's coming again. And he said, why? This is what Jim Baker said. Why is, it, why is that going to happen again? And this is all that Sadhu said. Because of the babies. Now listen, listen carefully. Because some of you already know where I'm going on this. But I knew that as well. But I didn't say anything because I live in L.A. I do not cast stones at Houston. I live in L.A., born and raised here, Hollywood, okay, know all about it. So I didn't say a word, 
But Jim Baker's wife goes, oh, oh, that's where they have the most, the most abortions. It's the most liberal place in our nation. Anybody can go at any time to Houston to get an abortion. And this is what Sadhu says. I didn't know that. So that's a sign. It's amazing that the Lord has been dealing with abortion in our lifetime, right? Since it happened, the church is, you know, good friends of ours and others, you know, we you know, pray against abortion and all that. The Lord is now saying that there's going to be Supreme Court justices coming around being replaced for various reasons where he's going to overturn it. Okay, the Lord is saying that. Yeah, you know, if you want to, if you want to find out who's been saying that, the most specific is a fireman, retired fireman named Mark um, Taylor. And uh, you can look him up. It's right there. And, uh, but the Lord's saying that. So anyway, so that was October, or August 21st. August 25th, we have this. And then um, October 10th, uh, this was the exposure, the beginning of the exposure of the sexual sins in Hollywood, especially starting out again with another Harvey, Harvey Weinstein, right? Are you with me so far? Yeah. Okay. So... Um, what, 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 are, what is God saying? Is he saying something? Let's put up here um, Luke 12, 2. Luke 12, 2 and 3 were the last 10 years probably the most, uh, by, by far, the most scripture, the one scripture, I, not as much I always pray, the most is always John six ten. Uh, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. But regarding our government, the most verse that I prayed the most in prayer meetings and so forth, was this one. And this is what Jesus is doing. He's speaking from heaven, but this is, he's performing this verse as well as many others. There is nothing what? Concealed. Concealed. The Lord um, gave us uh, uh, three words, gave me three words a year and a half ago, August 3rd was, it was exposure, storm, and cleansing. Neville Johnson had said something similar from that about a year, two or three years before. And now you hear it, Cindy Jacobs, uh, well, her apostolic council, prophetic council, she used the word uh, one time, expose, expose, expose. So the Lord is exposing things. You got that? I mean, that's clear, right? But he's doing it from heaven. Do you understand? And then he's judging. You understand? He's exposing, then he's judging. You get that? So if we don't know that it's the Lord, which I would say a good portion of the church does not even believe in what I'm telling you, that he's actually judging and doing things that they don't like or even a, a, a flood or anything like that. There is nothing concealed that will not be disclosed. So it means total exposure, you know, in the church. It's going to cleanse the pulpits in our nation. Amazing. It's going to really be uh, a, a shock. There is nothing concealed that will not be disclosed or hidden that will not be made known. Now watch this. Your secret meetings are going to be exposed. You know, let's see what happens with our government, who's really telling the truth, you know. But what you have said in dark will be heard in the daylight, and what you have whispered in the ear, in the inner rooms, will be proclaimed upon the roofs, or I like to, the old King James says, upon the housetops. So watch what's going on, you know, be aware of uh, these things, that God is speaking from heaven. Also, a big issue um, is this thing, this term, polar opposites. Now, um, you can put it up, but you need to scroll down to about, the, um, anyway, we'll put it up. This is one of my most regular verses, Matthew 13, 37 through 43. I'll just tell you briefly what it says, and we'll ro- scroll down real quickly. But what I want to get to is the harvest time, as we come to harvest time, we're going to see polar opposites. What does that mean? You're going to see wicked people get more wicked. You know, I, I, I grew up, you know, like everybody did, you know, in the days that you would never use the F word. Never. And it seems to be some people's, their, their, their biggest word. But it's now, it's become more than that. It's vile. It's not just that word. It's vile. It's direct. It's killing. You know, we hate this. And this is the, the thing. Is, is that a good leader will motivate out of the good nature of people of righteousness and justice, like specifically, and this is the man that we need to incorporate today, I believe, in the situations that we have, is Dr. Martin Luther King, because he dealt with incredible injustices, which I can barely think about in my lifetime. I was just a young kid in the 60s, 
but to think what he had to deal with, injustices, unbelievable, you know, the way that uh, his people were hurt and aligned and all that. To think of that. And yet, by the grace of God, he said, do not judge one another by the color of their skin, by the con- but by the content of their character. That's something everybody could say, that's right. You with me? And so he, he was the one, and he paid, his, he paid for it by his life because of anger and violence and all these terrible things. But we need, blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the sons and daughters of God. And we need to have, whether it's politicians or preachers or anybody else, to inspire people to bring out the best especially of Christians, of the divine nature. And Satan, you know, you know, Hitler was an amazing leader. He brought Germany back from destruction after World War I. It was amazing. If he would have stayed true to God, he would have gone down in history as one of the greatest kingdom or nation restorers in, of all time. But he started motivating people out of pride, Asian pride, you know, or, or Aryan pride, I should say, that we're the special race, all this kind of stuff. It was all based on race. Although he was a white guy. But it was race. It was like the Asian, you know, the, we're, we're the ones. We are the gifted ones, you see. Aryan, Aryan race. And uh, so it was on racism. But the people bought into it. And, you know, I don't know if you've ever been to places. I've been to Auschwitz. I was in Auschwitz um, for about two hours or so. And I had to come out because I could no longer breathe. I was told by my beautiful sister, um, who had a, at one time the largest church in Poland, um, she said, Rick, when you get within about four miles, you'll start feeling it. And uh, so these terrible atrocities that he caused, you know, again, against a race of Jews, people. But uh, he could have been a great leader, but he inspired people out of evil and darkness. And we have leaders today that are inspiring people out of darkness. And we have leaders today that it will hopefully inspire people out of the righteous purposes of God for our stay and hour. Yes. So anyway, now watch this. Jesus, we'll go through this very quickly. Uh, Jesus, so, Jesus said, the one who sows the good seed is the son of man. I sow good seed. It goes on to say, but the field is the world. Get that? The good seed stands for the people of the kingdom. The weeds are the people of the evil one. The devil is the one who sows them. You got that? Okay, okay. It says, and the enemy who sows them is the devil. The weeds... Go back, yeah. The enemy who sows him the devil. Uh, uh, the harvest is the what? The, the what? The now, it's, let me spell it for you. It's S-U-N-L-E-I-A, I think. But it means, it doesn't mean the end. It means the climax. <coughs> I've said this many times. It means the climax of a desired goal and a new beginning. Or a new day. Why does it say that? Why do you, can you interpret it that way? Because you'll find out he's going to rip up the wicked and his children are going to shine like the sun. That's what the end is. That's what the harvest is. Now watch this how it works. The enemy who sows in the devil, the harvest is the end of the age. So as we get closer and closer, the harvest is going to be God allowing. Now watch this. The weeds are pulled up and burned in the fire, so will it be at the end of the age. He's going to start removing evil people as he did in the days of Noah. Noah. Okay, so you have to know that the son of man will send out his angels. They will weed out of his kingdom everything that causes sin and all who do evil. Now watch this. They will throw them into the blazing furnace where they will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Next verse. Um, Then the righteous will shine like the sun in the kingdom of their father. He has an ear. Let him hear. That's what I'm talking about. Polar opposites. You're going to see people being led by the devil and you're going to see people led by God. (laughs) It says in uh, uh, th- uh, 1 John chapter 3, this is how you know who are the children of the devil and the children of God. He that doeth righteousness is righteous e- even as he is righteous. He that does evil is of the devil. Now, I know the church doesn't like to say that, but there's coming a great division. Not racial, not political, not Democrat, not Republican. It's a, it's a division between the race of Adam that is fallen and the race of the last Adam that is raised and born from above. You understand? So that's what I'm talking about here. So the Lord is beginning to shake everything that can be shaken. Why is he doing that? Because he's now invading the earth. 
He's coming. It's going to come in much greater ways. Jesus said the last days would be as the days of Noah. Again, I've said this before, but in the days of Noah, it was a set season of 40 days. Now it is not. Jesus revamped it and said, it's going to be in Matthew 24, he says this, it's going to be like a woman having a baby. It starts out lightly, more and more, more and more, more and more intense. So you're going to see more and more intense things. Now they call the, um, we used to have 100 uh, day floods. Then it was 500 day floods. Then it was, now they're calling it thousand. They used to say biblical proportions. Now they're going on to a thousand day, you know, a thousand year floods. See what I'm saying? Is it, is it escalating? So you want to be those who have an ear to hear what he is saying or warning us from heaven. Okay. Now if we go back there to Hebrews 12, you'll find out why he's doing it. Okay. So it says here in Hebrews 12, 25, you know, he's speaking, okay, he's speaking, he's warning us, okay, he's warning us, okay, what, what, what's going on? At that time, you will be receiving a kingdom. Do you know what that means? That means that there's soon going to be a different gospel preached. You say, what? Same Jesus, same Bible. But the emphasis will be, instead of, just raise your hand, don't be embarrassed. No one's going to see you. Which I'm, I'm not knocking. I, I, we were raised in that. Okay. Okay. I, okay. I, I, think, I think I want Jesus. I, I, I want him, but I don't want to raise my hand publicly. You know, I don't want anybody to see me. You with me? Yeah, that's right. I'm not knocking it. That's the way it was. We were little babies and so forth. That's fine. But it's going to be a, a little different in the coming days because the true revivals of God, they said to Peter, to the preacher, What must we do to be saved? It wasn't, you know, lead me in a sinner's prayer. And I'm not against that. I'm just saying, the Bible shows me another dimension of evangelism. And Maria Woodworth Eder, Smith Wigglesworth, cities would close down when those people would come in. Bars would close down. Jails would have awesome revivals. We're going to have some of the most powerful churches in prisons. Amen. Because they know they're in trouble. They don't have to hold a whole lot of conviction. They already know they're in trouble. They got nowhere else to go. They're going to, that's, some people say, I'm going to go to prison this Sunday. It's got more action than my church does, you know. <laughs> Amen. At least I'm with people who know they need God, you know. Amen. Yeah. Now, you remember last week, uh, three of our precious women, our elder here, you know, Marnie, got up and spoke and gave us very practical things. Then um, uh, Charity got up and spoke powerfully. But I, I noticed that there was something that she said that hit me the strongest, and it was this. You're either in or you're out. You hear last week? Then my wife gets up, and she's talking away, you know, giving her message and so forth and so on. And she says, and the lukewarm, lukewarmness, you remember exactly your words? Lukewarmness is conforming to the culture. Now listen to this. I have never, I've been in hundreds and hundreds of meetings, believe me, where the Holy Spirit is, told, I think, almost in, at least in a whole lot of control of the whole thing. Everything's happening. Demons are coming out. People are on the floor. People bouncing out of their seats, screaming. You know, getting delivered, all this, seen those. But last week I heard something I'd never heard before. When she said that lukewarmness is being conformed to the culture, I heard a gasp. Never heard it before. Anybody hear it? Was it only me? People, uh, <gasps> that's what I heard last week. But it was like, ah, that, was, that was really loud. What, honey? It's a lu- lukewarm, church. lukewarm church, right. Did I say that? Okay. Oh, I didn't say church. Lukewarm church, that's what it was, yeah lukewarm church and uh, how much is the church today in LA conform to the world come on you know it's come on it's for real and the people love to have it that way by the way it's real simple everybody can come in but um, you know and you might think I'm going too far but I'm only giving you the Bible in Acts chapter 5 it says that people were afraid to join themselves with them but they did take their sick to them why? Because the presence of the Lord is like, you either got to really be connected with those people 
or, you know, or something, you know. I mean, I don't know what they were thinking. It says the people didn't want to connect with them. They were, if they feared them, they reverenced them, you know. Well, I don't even think that, 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 that's, that, had, that had happened, true. And Ananias and Sapphira are, are coming again. They, they're in the church. But uh, it's going to be a real shake-up call. So anyway, what I'm saying is, is check it out in Acts chapter 5. Just check. What's this pastor talking about? Acts chapter 5, that's all. When I said, you know, when they said to Peter, what must we do to be saved? That's Acts chapter 2, right? So let's only deal with the Bible. We want to go back to the Bible and to that standard of holiness and purity in the Lord. And uh, now, I want to give you, uh, we, we went all the way through this now, watch this. How much more, it says, if we turn away from him who speaks us from heaven. Is he speaking from heaven, Pastor? Yes, he is. Yes, he is, through the prophets. Yeah, go ahead. And in many other ways. At that time, his voice shook the earth, but now he has promised once more to shake not only the earth, but also the heavens. <laughs> what does that look like? Listen carefully. It means the destruction of powers of darkness over cities, nations. Cities, nations, states, whatever. How can that be? Let's real quick, I want to come back to this, Betsy. Can we go to Isaiah 24, 21? Isaiah 24, 21 is the most noted, I have maybe 25 scripture references on this verse because it's one of my and hopefully your DNA verses. When the Lord begins to attack and enforce his victory at Calvary over the powers of darkness over nations because there'll be a time when virtually, for example, in, in our nation, in Massachusetts, there was a time when they said possibly only 50 people in that state were not saved. I would say it almost might be the opposite now. I don't know. But all, all, I hope that's not true. I have no idea. I don't even know what the population is. But it's not known to be a Christian nation, Massachusetts, or a Christian state, is it? But all but 50, they said, had given their lives to Jesus Christ in Massachusetts during the Great Awakenings, you understand? So that's where powers of darkness were broken and people saw and they came to the Lord. In that day, the Lord will what? Punish what? The, power. the powers of the heavens above and the what? Okay, now watch how this works. You're going to see greater exposure in high places of people that are under demonic leadership. Like the Christians are supposed to be led by the Spirit. They're being led by demonic powers. You know, um, people who said they knew that, they were told this from the Lord, that um, Hitler had about 600 demons in him. Okay? And was, this person was also told if the church had prayed for him and not been afraid of him, that they would have been able to get rid of over half of them. Okay? So anyway, I want you to see this. In that day, the Lord will punish. Now, people that study the scriptures know that Matthew 20, or Isaiah 24, 25, and 26, they call it the small apocrypha of the Old Testament, or like the book of Revelation summarized. Okay? And, um, but this is a day when God begins to deal with judgment on powers of darkness, okay? That's what I want you to know. The Lord is dealing with the spirit of murder, which is really abortion in our nation. That's what he's dealing with. Child sacrifice. He's dealing with it. He's going to deal with pedophilia in our nation, and it's going to be an amazing exposure, okay? That's where we're going. I hope you have begun to sense that. If you haven't, I, you'll see it. In that day, the Lord will punish the powers in the heavens above, the kings on the earth uh, below. Now, let's go back here, because you'll know exactly when it is. If we go back to uh, Hebrews 12, you'll find out as the kingdom of God begins to come in preparation for the preaching of the gospel of the kingdom. Jesus said in Matthew 24 that the end cannot come before the end would come the preaching of the gospel of the kingdom. Well, what is that? It's much different from the gospel being preached today. The gospel of the kingdom is real short preaching. Well, at least in this statement. Repent, John said, repent, for the kingdom of God is at hand. Why could John say that? Because the king was soon to show up. Listen to this now. So John preached, repent, for the kingdom of God is at hand. John, of course, was related to Jesus. They may have known each other as young boys and children and so forth. But John, when he saw Jesus, it was different than seeing his cousin. He saw the Holy Spirit come upon him, and when even before that, he looked at Jesus, and under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, he says, Oh, oh, behold the Lamb of God, who takes away the sin of the whole world. 
He got that by revelation, friends. So he's preparing the way of the Lord. And it's like, whoa, there he is. You know, shock. You know, so here it is. The words, once more, indicate the removing of what can be shaken, that is, created things, so that what cannot be shaken may remain. Well, what's going to remain? Next verse. Therefore, since we are receiving, since we are receiving a kingdom, what are you saying, Pastor? Very clearly. I'm telling you we're moving deeper into the days of Noah. I'm telling you we're moving deeper into the Lord getting the attention of the whole earth. He's coming out of the box of denominationalism and out of every other doctrine. He's speaking from heaven. That's what I'm trying to tell you. But he's speaking it, even my neighbor back at our first home, 30 years ago, Bob was his name. He was retired out of the industry and so forth. He was a cameraman and all this. He sat down one time and goes, Rick, I got to get in tune with my higher power. I said, Bob, you got a Bible? He goes, yeah. I said, go home and read Matthew 24, bro. I said, let's talk. But it's like, I got to get in touch with my higher power. Dude, it's coming for everybody. Okay? Your next door neighbor and mine. But it's like, the Lord is going to shake everything because he's speaking from heaven. He doesn't want anybody to perish. He doesn't want anybody to go to an eternal hell. He doesn't want anybody to be lost. But he's going to start speaking loudly from heaven. He that hath an ear, let him hear. Therefore, since we are receiving a kingdom, oh, he's shaking everything, and we're going to be receiving a kingdom. That's why the ministry of John the Baptist is so important. Repent, for the kingdom of God is at hand. Then Jesus comes along and says the same thing. Repent, for the kingdom of God is at hand. That is the way that the gospel of the kingdom will be preached. Not raise your hand. Not raise your hand. Repent. But this is the thing. When he, the spirit of truth, is come, John 6, 18, or 16, 8. When he, the spirit of truth, is come, he will convict the world of sin. We haven't yet seen that. We're going to watch the Holy Spirit. You know, it's good to witness to people. Don't get me wrong. We witness to people. Talk to my neighbors. All that. But when the Lord releases the Holy Spirit to convict the world of sin, it'll be easier to witness. When they're coming under conviction for domestic violence, for what they watch on television, whatever it is, not knowing the Lord, returning to the, their childhood little Baptist days or even in a Catholic church or whatever, where at least they knew about Jesus. Grandmother prayed for them and told them about Jesus. Whatever it is, God is beginning to awaken the earth by shaking it from heaven. Amen. So he says, therefore, since we're receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken, let us be thankful and so worship God acceptably with reverence and awe. Reverence and awe. Whoa! Now listen, I have to be real careful on this one. The largest fires in L.A.'s history was three miles from my house. Three miles from my house. Now, it didn't get very much except land along the 210s where we live, 210 freeway. And, uh, but you go about five miles, all mountains are burned. So it was the largest territory in L.A. history. But I would go out, we, the way our house is set up, we're about eight, 50 yards from our street. There's two other houses down there, a little area together. But if I walk up to the end of the driveway and look to the left, it looked like Armageddon, clouds and red, fiery red. I look above me, blue sky, look to the left, gorgeous. I think, wow, this is amazing. Looks like Armageddon down here. Looks like heaven over here, Lord. This is amazing. And uh, even the very day that the Lord, uh, anyway, we were there uh, just praying, and uh, the, the fire left our mountains. I went home and told my wife, I said, it left the mountain, honey. I was up on the mountain, and it left. I saw it leave our mountains. She goes, Lynn just called and said, it just, that they just put it on the news that it left La Crescenta, which is where we live. Okay. And so praise God for all those who were praying. Now, here's my point. Okay, shortly thereafter, another one came. And then the rains came. In Montecito, we've been there probably 20 times with our kids, maybe more, give or take. I don't know. But we know that area, Santa Barbara area, it's very dear to us. It's very beautiful, okay? It rained at 3 o'clock in the morning, a half an inch in five minutes. A half an inch in five minutes. I do not know how they're going to rebuild some of that area. Did anybody see how big the stones were? 
I don't know if they're not going to say it's an eternal flood zone or whatever. But I cannot go by there ever again without remembering those people that went to bed. In fact, they were told the, the fire people were there. They knew it was coming. And why some of the people didn't leave their homes, I, I don't know. But the thing was, it was amazing how it started. One lady and her boyfriend, they opened the door. She was gone and he was put up against a fence. But in one moment, at one moment of time, kaboom, okay? Miraculously, uh, a few people uh, survived, even a kid and so forth. Why, why am I saying that? It happened basically in our backyard. This wasn't Houston, okay? It wasn't uh, Florida. It was right here, okay? Right up the road where we are going to be passing by it uh, later this week. All I can say is, is those people had no idea it was their last night. Or was it 20 that were killed, right? They had no idea. Now, they were warned, and the, and the fire were there. The firemen were there. Can you imagine these firemen out there at night? Can you imagine, you know, with flashlights and stuff, looking for people? Did you hear about that little baby that they found in a heap of tra- whatever? That mud, and they heard it crying, and they rescued it? Can you imagine that? Anyway... Um, this was very close to home. So is that a sign? It's a sign to me. It's a sign to me. I can never drive by, let alone, what's the other place right down the road, honey? I forget how you say it. La Conchita, yeah. I've been through there several times. You know, they've had mudslides. Guy went out to get ice cream one night, came home, his wife, his children were all killed, several of them. So every time I go by, that was about eight or nine years ago, maybe, give or take. And it happened before that. So I can't go by those things without, oh, God, this is a sobering time. You know, well, tell me something good. I'm trying to tell you the truth so that you can be in line with God. (laughs) Pastor, encourage me. The encouragement is you're receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken. (laughs) Repent, get involved. And it starts with this. This is what I say. This is my little statement that the Lord gave me years ago. Let me rule you so I can rule through you. I love this statement that this uh, lady in 1906 got. She was seeking God. Uh, Martha Wing Robinson, back in Massachusetts, actually was probably in Toronto at the time. She said, the Lord was drawing near and he was getting victories in my spirit, soul, and body. I thought, that's exactly, sister, that's exactly, you've said it better than I said it. I like it. She said, Jesus is getting victories in my spirit, soul, and body. Jesus is getting victories in my spirit, soul, and body. I'm done. Amen. So, I just want to briefly pray for all of us. Um, I love the Lord more than I ever have. But one of the missing ingredients in the church today and in the earth is a lack of the reverential fear of God. But it's going to come. He said through Jeremiah 3240, I believe. It says, I have put my fear in your heart that you would not wickedly depart from me. So I want to pray a prayer over you, that you would be one of those, oh, let's finish, put that one verse up at the very end, 43, 13, 43 of Matthew, that the righteous would shine like the sun. That's where we're going. We want all of you to be those Christians who shine like the sun. Then the righteous will what? Shine like the sun in the kingdom of their father. Who has an ear? Let him hear. Lord, I pray that these people, some of them may be new, some of them are just, you know, here, whatever, first time, second time, whatever. You bought them with a price. I pray that they would say, I want to be those who shine like the sun, who are part of the radiant bride at the end of the age, during the time of harvest, when men and women, boys and girls all over the earth are being awakened to a living God who loves them through all kinds of things. But Lord, especially you said, in the last days, You would pour out your spirit on all flesh. Amen. Amen. Can you say this with me? Heavenly Father, Father, help me me to be like Mary. Be Be it done unto me me according to your word. word. Open my eyes. eyes. Open my ears. ears. Give me a hunger for the Bible. Bible. In Jesus' name. name. Amen. 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 God bless you. Thank you very much.